Mr. Wells fails to understand the premise of selective pressure. The drought is selected for a hardier beak to crack harder nuts. Thus, selective pressure drove beak girth one way. When the drought ended, better food was available, so a more versatile mid-sized beak was selected for. This drove beak length back. Both of these are examples of directional selective pressure. Evolution did happen. Speciation did not. To get speciation, pressure must be placed only on the middle ground. This is called disruptive selection. Let's say we have a localized drought such that longer beaks are preferred in one area and shorter, stronger beaks are preferred in another. This allows both extremes of beak length to live, and by selecting against the mid-length beaks, the variants are pushed apart from one another. Eventually, they get so pushed apart that they can no longer hybridize. That is speciation. The 99 article was not misleading. It was showing how large an effect small environmental changes will have on a population, and predicting, based on that effect, how quickly speciation could occur given the right selective pressure. That it shifted back so quickly would only serve to reiterate the original point. The eighth icon is four-winged Drosophila. His arguments are truly absurd. They frighten me with their absurdity. He calls into question whether or not there is a connection between genetic mutations and morphological mutations. I'm actually stunned. Protein synthesis is very well documented. A set of three nucleotides in a gene codes for a certain amino acid. If one of these three nucleotides change, it may well code for a different amino acid. Different proteins don't always work the same way. Perhaps this protein slows down the growth of a set of cells along the fly's back. Without as much regulation of these cells during development, perhaps the fly grows a new set of wings. A small change can cascade and make several large changes. Genetic mutations and morphological mutations are solidly linked through mountains of evidence. The ninth icon is horses. Wells thinks horses evolved in a directed manner. His argument is that the extinct side branches don't indicate that it evolved. He brings up an analogy of a cattle drive. The cattle are directed, but every now and then there's a stray. To which I reply, why must it be driven by a cowboy? Perhaps it's a herd of buffalo. A few go stray, a few strays survive, and no direction is ever actually applied. In order to argue design, Mr. Wells needs evidence of design. Without it, his wheels are spinning in the mud. The tenth and final icon is the descent of man. Wells quote minds a few anthropologists, then brings up Piltdown Man, saying that scientists thought it was proof of descent of man from ape, then disproved it. He fails to mention how it was originally disproven. Many skeletons were found of human ancestors, and Piltdown Man didn't fit in anywhere. Poor guy. As such, this bit of false evidence was originally discarded on the basis of an overabundance of real evidence. It was later found that the reason why it didn't fit in is because it was, in fact, a fake. The overabundance of real evidence is never mentioned by Mr. Wells. Oh hey, speaking of bad teaching material, remember Chapman, that guy from the Discovery Institute? He actually came up with a lesson plan to teach 10th grade students. It begins with an assessment of the student's critical thought of Darwin's evolution. It asks the students for a few definitions. Theory, biological evolution, macro and micro evolution, the sample definitions, and likely what the teachers will be comparing the responses to, were as follows. Theory, a supposition or a system of ideas intended to explain something, especially one based on general principles independent of the thing to be explained. In other words, they're teaching the students that scientists just make the shit up as they go. Biological evolution. Changes in the genetic composition of a population through successive generations. Close, but no cigar. Under this definition, evolution wouldn't exist for anything that hasn't changed in a while. Macroevolution. Large-scale evolution occurring over geologic time that results in the formation of new taxonomic groups. Not quite. 
Macroevolution is a term used rather often by creationists, typically referring to the divergence of a new species. Technically, a breed or subspecies is a taxonomic group. According to their definition, evolution within the species would still be macroevolution. And that brings us to microevolution. Evolution resulting from a succession of relatively small genetic variations that often cause the formation of a new subspecies. The funny thing is, you most often hear the term microevolution used by someone who asserts macroevolution doesn't exist. It also has a strong correlation with the belief that the Earth is 10,000 years old. The curriculum also asks each of the students to submit three pieces of evidence for and against evolution. Of course, this gives us an implied appeal to authority. By giving out these papers, it's like the teacher is saying there is equal evidence against evolution as for it. Hell, with the sources the guys gave, the curriculum seems to encourage ID. Looking through them, I noticed a few patterns. Number one, most of the evolution side sources were from high-end science journals. They're rather expensive. I saw one in there that was cheap or free online, and it was Darwin's book. Granted, it was Darwin himself who came up with natural selection, however, this is not a 10th grade book. Intelligent though it may be, it's incredibly boring, even for a college student. Only the most exceptional 10th graders would be able to get through the whole thing. In any case, Darwin's book doesn't account for mutation. Better sources are available. And number two, I also noticed how many of the anti-evolution sources were from books likely to be found in a high school library. Perhaps a change of scenery would give me a fresh perspective. Mr. Berlinski, I assume. Stein, How are you, sir? Stein next goes to find David Berlinski, crank and evolution denialist. David Berlinski believes that since he can't explain why sharks haven't changed much, why spiders eat their mates, and the value of a partial eye, that evolution can't have happened. Crash course, Dave. Sharks haven't changed much because they're fairly well adapted, and any change that reduces survivability in the environment would be selected against. When a male spider mates with a female, he passes on his genes. At the species level, now that another generation is going to happen, it really doesn't matter what happens to him. The female has a lot of eggs to lay, and convenient sack of proteins nearby, well... As for the eye, try telling someone with glasses from a malformed lens that their eyes don't work, and they may as well be blind. Try telling someone with only 5% of their vision that the partial sight that allows them to walk around and not get run over by cars, that this vision may as well not exist. David Berlinski also tries to connect evolution with the Holocaust. He thinks that the idea of the Aryan race was forced human evolution. See, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's actually more favorable to preserve biodiversity. Thus, if there were truly non-trivial differences between ethnicities, evolution would tell us to preserve the races, not destroy all but one. Hitler was a sociopath, not a scientist. Let's put it this way. Before you can ask, is Darwinian theory correct or not, you have to ask the preliminary question, is it clear enough so that it could be correct? That's a very different question. One of, one of my um, prevailing doctrines about Darwinian theory is, man, that, that thing is just a mess. It's like looking into a room full of smoke. Um, noth nothing in the theory is precisely, clearly, carefully defined or delineated. It lacks all of the rigor one expects from mathematical physics, and mathematical physics lacks all the rigor one expects from mathematics. So we're talking about a gradual descent down the level of intelligibility until we reach evolutionary biology. You're a mathematician, Dave. Remember that experiment we did? The one with the dice? It reduces to the function n factorial over x to the nth. Essentially, this would represent the number of generations required according to the law of averages to produce a sequence. 
What I've given you isn't precisely evolution, there's many variables involved, but basically the idea is the same. It's not a room full of smoke, it's statistics, the lowest common denominator of business math, which is in turn one of the simplest math courses you can find in a college. I thought you liked math, Dave. 